Hi, I'm Andrew Work from NextChange, and we are at the MTech event here in Hong Kong, uh, where there are all kinds of absolutely brilliant, cutting-edge researchers who are presenting some of the materials uh, to a broader audience, and not only talking about the research, but how it could change society. I've got one of those uh, people here today. This is Professor Donald Sadaway, and he is with the Materials Science Department at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a.k.a. MIT, and he was talking today about liquid metal batteries and some of the work that they're doing and a company that they are going to be, uh, a company that is, uh, going, is is already been invested in and is going to market. We want to talk about that a little bit today. Uh, Professor Sadaway, thank you very much for talking to Next Change. My pleasure. And, you know, you said during your presentation earlier today that these, the introduction of these batteries was going to be to the electricity supply chain as refrigeration uh, transformed the food supply chain. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what you're doing and how it's going to transform energy supply? Sure. So um, I'm working on a, a new technology that can give us grid level storage as opposed to the kind of uh, batteries that uh, you carry around in your pocket in your cell phone or, or even in a laptop computer. And it's a, it's a different kind of technology because the scale is so much larger and uh, the performance demands are so much greater, the, the, the service lifetime is much longer, and oddly enough the price point is much lower. So if, when you put all of those requirements in place, You've got to think differently, and that's how come I came up with the liquid metal battery. Okay. Now, uh, you talk about being liquid metal, and you talk about a transforming grid level supply. Uh, during your presentation, you said, you, you know, as you just said, you're not talking about cars. During your presentation, you said you're not talking about automobiles uh, because of the liquid metal uh, dimension of it. You said the smallest dimension was perhaps uh, that of a battery that would be used in managing your home level, uh, a typical North American home. What, when you say grid level, what's the biggest? So if the smallest level is a house or a battery that you put in a house, what's the largest level? The largest level is whatever you want it to be because you can, you can add cells and make a battery larger and larger. I mean, if you look at something about the size of a 40-foot shipping container, that would probably give you about two megawatt hours. And um, a typical uh, American household they consume between five and 10 kilowatt hours per day. So that's between 200 and 400 homes. Would, wow. that, would, that would be sort of something uh, that would service a, a subdivision. Okay. Um, but then, you know, if you want to put four or five shipping containers together, that's fine too. Um, so th you can scale it up to, to whatever you want. It's, it, it eventually, it becomes how much real estate do you want to occupy. Right. Um, you're talking about the size of this. Uh, you know, earlier on, you talked about taking a different approach. This is one of the things that MIT is known for, uh, you know, having people that can think a little bit differently. You said that in the past, people had taken small and expensive batteries and tried to scale them up, but you took a completely different approach. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so I looked at... Uh, I, I sought inspiration from outside battery field totally. And the other area of uh, research that I've been uh, working on for about 40 years is uh, electrometallurgy, um, how you use electricity to produce metal, and uh, specifically aluminum, magnesium, titanium. And I looked at an aluminum smelter, and I saw something that consumes huge quantities of electricity, um, and, uh, and yet you can turn dirt into metal for less than a dollar a kilogram. So I said, gee, you know, that thing consumes a large amount of electricity and does so cheaply. Mm -hmm. uh, if I could take that thing and figure out how to teach it to store electricity and give it back on demand, I know at the end of the day I'd have something that was big and cheap. So that was my approach, to start with something that is already electrically active and figure out how to teach it to be a battery as opposed to start with something that's already a battery and teach you how to be big. Mm -hmm. And um, that that's the path I took. Okay, and you know, people want, ideally, if we're gonna, if we're gonna revolutionize how we store energy uh, to make it cheaper to, ha to cheaper to produce, but also cheaper to store, um, you said we gotta make it cheap. You said we have to make it dirt cheap. What did you mean by that? Well, the, the issue here is that um, we're not competing battery versus battery. It's battery versus hydrocarbons. So right now, if people need to back up intermittent uh, or interruptible power, they turn to gas or to diesel. Yep. And both of these are abundant, cheap, 
and also the the burners are really really cheap so uh, if I'm going to compete against diesel and gas uh, my electrochemistry has to be radically different from anything like a lithium-ion battery mm -hmm. and so that's why I said uh, if I'm going to make something dirt cheap I better make it out of dirt meaning yeah. abundant earth abundant elements um, and then make sure that the, the, the design of the battery is is primitive that's where lithium ion fails lithium ion uh, you know the gigafactory costs five giga dollars yeah. so i mean it's okay if you're talking about a hundred thousand dollar automobile but that's not going to get you into grid level storage so mm -hmm. i had to think about things very very differently sure uh, and I think, in, especially in Asia, a lot of places where the electricity supply can be really unreliable, they've had to choose between either not industrializing uh, or implementing really dirty backup. When the when the grid electricity fails, they fire up the diesel generators, but batteries like yours could be part of the solution to a cleaner, more reliable uh, way of managing you know, uh, unreliable energy flow. Uh, that's great. Uh, you've got kind of a funny story about how the business got started and what led to your first, uh, what led to your big investor, you know, what, what attracted your first big investor. Uh, could you tell us that story quickly? Sure. So um, I, uh, I was uh, for many years teaching a large freshman chemistry class at MIT. It had uh, five, 600 students in it. And the, the freshman class is about a thousand. So I had over half the freshman class electing to take this. And um, uh, in order to accommodate all of this, uh, they started recording the lectures and then eventually posting them on the internet when the internet got enough bandwidth. Mm -hmm. And then MIT started this uh, uh, project called Open Courseware, where they started putting all of our material on the web for free. Yeah. And uh, so my lectures went up. And uh, at some point later, uh, I got a note saying to me that uh, Bill Gates had been watching my lectures on uh, open courseware. And I said, oh, that's fine. Um, and then a uh, few years later, I get a, an email from a woman who says she's his uh, administrative assistant. He's going to come to Boston in uh, late September. Would I have 90 minutes to meet with him? To totally believable. I get emails like that all the time. Well, I ignored the email because I thought the students had hacked into my account and they were just making a fool of me, so I yeah. didn't answer. And then about a week later, she wrote me again and said, maybe you didn't see this, but uh, Mr. Gates would really like to meet you. Wow. So uh, I said, yeah, all right, well, if this is true. Uh, so we made an appointment, and he came to see me, and we spent about 90 minutes together. And we talked about distance learning, computers and education. I even talked about my chemistry lectures. Yeah. And then we started talking about my research, and I told him about this idea of the liquid metal battery. And he said, uh, you know, if you ever decide to spin this out, let me know. I'd be willing to put some money into it. And a year later, I, with two of my uh, students, decided to form a company, and they approached him, and he became our first investor. So I met Bill Gates not because I wrote an article for the Wall Street Journal. I met him because he watched my chemistry lectures online. Fantastic. So not only are we getting a hope for the future uh, that could revol revolutionize the energy supply industry and lead to cleaner energy, but uh, a message to professors, don't push off teaching those first year classes. It could pay off big time. That's exactly correct. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored here to be with uh, Professor Donald Sadway from MIT and uh, telling us a little bit about what is the, uh, the likely revolutionary future of energy. Professor Sadway, it was a pleasure speaking to you and hearing you present today. Thank you. My pleasure. Andrew Work for Next Change with Professor Donald Sadway of MIT.